Okay, awesome. Um, Good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Allie Pruitt. I'm the CEO and founder of the Impact Project. Welcome to episode five of Success Sessions. We're so excited to be welcoming an incredible panel today to talk about comparing careers um, and all the options available to you with your law degree. Um, the opportunities are endless, and hopefully this session will shed some light on all the amazing things that you can do. So I'm joined today um, by an incredible co-host, the 2021-22 National Law Student of the Year. We'll have you introduce yourself and let everyone know um, what you're about, what you do, and we'll have our panel introduce themselves thereafter. Thank you, Ali. Yeah, I, I don't know what criteria they use to give that award, but thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here and serve as your co-host. Um, thank you, Ali, for the invitation and a huge shout out to all the inspirational work you've been doing with the Impact Project. Um, thank you also to all the panelists. You know, we look forward to hearing your words of wisdom. My name is Abdullahi Ture. Uh, I'm originally from Sierra Leone, West Africa, but I've mainly lived in New York and Maryland since moving to the States. I'm currently a third year law student at Fordham. Uh, presently, I intern at the National Football League, also known as NFL. And after graduation, I'll be at Covington and Bruins, New York office as a litigation associate. So excited to be here and uh, let's get started. Awesome. Okay, so we'll have the panelists. We'll kind of go down the line, have you all each briefly introduce yourselves, um, and then we'll hop into our questions. As a reminder for our panelists, folks jumping on, um, please feel free to ask questions throughout. We are giving away a $100 scholarship to a student who engages with us and our panelists today. Um, so please use the chat feature, use the raise the hand feature, ask these incredible individuals questions, um, gain that insight. This is like free game, you guys. So utilize that. Um, so without further ado, we will start with um, Judge Rochford. If you could introduce yourself to our guest today. Good morning. Uh, I'm so delighted to be with all of you. I'm so grateful for the introduction from um, our mutual friend, Richard Daniels, to Allie. And I spent <clears throat> some time talking on the phone with Allie, and she just energized me in such a way um, that she's really continued to be such an inspiration to me. But I am a judge in the 19th Judicial Circuit, which is in Lake County, Illinois. But my career in law has been kind of long and winding. I've been in the practice of law for 35 years, started uh, working for an attorney in Chicago in personal injury. I was an assistant state's attorney for um, four years. I opened my own law practice, which I maintained for 23 years. During that time, I was also a commissioner of the Court of Claims, which is one of those law jobs you probably haven't heard about, but it's when the state of Illinois gets sued you can only sue them in the court of claims. The, uh, the state is exempt from prosecution, like the king has sovereign immunity, the state has the same. So the, the court of claims is the only place that you can sue the state of Illinois. So every action against the state of Illinois is heard there. And I was a commissioner, so I uh, heard those trials for 23 years. And then I was also a hearing officer for a variety of villages, um, local villages. And then I've been on the bench for nine years. I think the one thing that has been consistent through all of my work uh, in and around the courts has been a commitment to um, providing access to justice and also public service. And I know that all of you here today join me in that, um, in that important uh, commitment. So my pleasure to be here and I look forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Okay, um, Julie Kaler, if you could introduce yourself, please. Hi, everyone. My name is um, uh, Julie Kaler. I am a um, public defender in Cook County. I have been a public defender since I uh, graduated law school in 1996. And I joined the office actually uh, prior to that um, as a clerk. I clerked for uh, several years um, while I was in law school, just like Allie did when she clerked for me, and that is how I, I got to know Allie. Um, I worked my way through the public defender's office. I uh, started off in, a, um, in the juvenile justice system. I was in um, abuse and neglect, and that is where um, uh, you defend parents who have been accused of abusing their children, and then you try and uh, reunite the family. I was then moved to um, 26th Street, uh, where I have remained ever since. And I uh, started off in uh, prelims, where you just do 
prelim, hundreds of prelims every single day. Um, one right after another, you interview people. It's very, it's a very quick, you really learn uh, the process of standing up and handling a, a vast number of cases at once. Um, after prelims, I moved uh, to night narcotics, something that they don't have anymore, which was a fantastic <laughs> job for a, a young uh, person. Um, we would come in and, and because of the overflow of drug cases at that time, they held court in the evenings. And uh, so all the cases were drug cases. You, it was, once again, it was like a hundred cases a day you'd be handling and you would do trials and motions in the evenings. It would start at four and end when you were done. Um, but then uh, those, um, uh, they closed those courtrooms and I moved into the felony day courtrooms where, um, you know, the, uh, you do any type of trial uh, imaginable um, other than a misdemeanor. It's all felony. I, I was there for several years until I um, uh, was promoted into the homicide task force. I only do homicides. I was there for 16 years. I um did a number of uh, homicide cases. I, I mean, we would have, we have, I started out when there was a death penalty in Illinois and I, I've done several death penalty cases and um, uh, eventually, the, thankfully, the death penalty was um, overturned here in um, Illinois. And now I handle um, uh, uh, just homicide cases. There's a task force within um, the public defender's office that that's all we do, just the homicides. And I've recently, um, during the pandemic, I became a super, uh, supervisor in that unit. So I'm now a supervisor um, in the homicide task force. Wonderful. Um, and last but certainly not least, Mr. Kapoor, if you could please introduce yourself. You guys, he's joining us from Ohio. So we do know we have an outside Illinois person with us today. Very, very excited. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Ellie. And uh, first of all, I want to commend you and Abdullah for um, being active in the Impact Project and uh, sponsoring this event. Uh, I, you know, it, I know it takes a lot of time and effort to put something together. And I want to commend both of you uh, for reaching out. And um, I think the theme that's already been alluded to by my um, two co-panelists is that law can be uh, a great vehicle for public service. Um, I'm in the private sector currently. I'm a partner at Jones Day. Uh, but uh, last week, for example, I spent a week in El Paso, Texas, working with kids in need of defense counseling unaccompanied minors uh, on what their rights are, what they have to do to uh, get um, uh, status here in the United States. And um, there are, even if you go into the private sector, there are a variety of opportunities. There are many opportunities to be involved in public service. Um, I had spent another week earlier with a Kind as well in uh, at Fort Bliss at the uh, shelter for, un for unaccompanied minors. Uh, similarly, we at Jones Day have a, an office on the border at uh, Laredo where we counsel uh, asylum seekers. And, and I think every law firm, you know, uh, almost every lawyer seeks to give back in some way, uh, even if they are in the private sector. And, and in fact, I think it's, it's almost necessary because clients also expect uh, today that um, their lawyers are involved in public service. Um, the area, I'm, I'm a M&A lawyer, a corporate lawyer, uh, but I'm sure many of you have heard about the, the terms ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And every corporation today is being measured by how strong their commitment to environmental sustainability, to social diversity, to governance issues. And so uh, when clients look to hire their uh, lawyers, that's one of the things they look at. I myself um, started uh, my career back in 85. I um, uh, graduated from law school and then spent a year in Quito, Ecuador uh, on a Fulbright uh, doing research on Ecuadorian labor law. Uh, I came back and practiced with a law firm in New York for a year and then uh, clerk for a judge on the US Sixth Circuit in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, went back to the New York firm for a couple of months and then was in Germany with a program with the German government with uh, 18 other uh, lawyers from Europe uh, and the United States, uh, which was quite interesting. And uh, I still keep in touch with all those folks. 
Uh, then I came back to New York and then ultimately uh, came to Jones Day in 1990, um, in part because I wanted to do international work somewhere between New York and Chicago, uh, since I'd grown up in Rochester, New York, uh, and, and do in particular work involving international transactions. At that time, uh, Jones Day was one of the few firms that sort of fit that mold of having uh, uh, an office between uh, New York and Chicago and doing international, having offices elsewhere in the world and having an international footprint. Uh, so that's what attracted me to Jones Day. But also what attracted me to Jones Day or to Cleveland was the ability to be involved in the community um, because you want to feel part of whatever community you're living in. And um, Cleveland has a strong history of civic engagement. Uh, it has one of the first uh, found a community foundations, the Cleveland Foundation, uh, and has uh, an incredible uh, set of uh, community resources. You know, we have the best library system in the country. Uh, we have uh, the, the best orchestra, one of the three best orchestras in the world. Uh, we have a park system that equals every, you know, I mean, every other park system. Uh, there's uh, good football teams. There's a lot of social service organizations. And so uh, Cleveland provided that opportunity. And, and uh, the one nice thing about being with a law firm in Cleveland is that one has an opportunity to engage in the community. I've been on the board of the Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga County Community Library Board. I'm on the board of Notre Dame College of Ohio. Uh, I've been with, involved with the City Club. I've been involved with Esperanza, El Barrio, uh, with a variety of organizations. And uh, I would urge all of you to think about not only where you want to work in terms of an organization, but also where you want to involve uh, be working in terms of a community so that you can be involved and feel part of the community. For me, going to a larger city uh, felt like I might get lost in the shuffle, whereas here um, it's a smaller city and you have an opportunity to be a little, little bit more engaged, although I, I guess I'm sure that you can do that anywhere. But uh, that was also something that uh, you know, attracted me to, to uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, in terms of my practice, uh, like I mentioned, I'm an M&A lawyer. Um, I do international transactions and um, I've for the most part been in Cleveland, but uh, last year I returned from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I had been in Brazil for six years and had an opportunity to practice in our office in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, and then that's also a nice part of uh, large law firms right now is that they are global places and you have an opportunity uh, to be engaged with and to potentially live abroad and involve, be involved with different pe peoples of different cultures and different backgrounds, not only within the United States, but globally. I think almost any transaction today has some global element. And, and that's something that I would also urge folks is to think of you know, globally where you wanna be involved and, and use your talents. And uh, I, I, see, I see from the, People have joined us. It looks like a number of you do have uh, are from backgrounds, international backgrounds, and that can be a real uh, plus or a real attribute uh, in the job market today. But in any event, um, uh, thank you very much again for giving me that opportunity, and I hope to engage with more of you and about the process of looking for a job and uh, building a career in the law profession. Wonderful, thank you. So um, as you can tell, right, from, from everyone we have here, we strategically brought in folks in a variety of different arrays. So we have the public sector, we have the judiciary, we have the private sector, right? So that was obviously done on purpose. And our goal here is to shed light on, on how young students, how these students coming through their legal career can uncover their passions, right? I always say to all of our Impact Project members, if you find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. So find something that you're passionate about. Not for the money, not for the, you know, whatever success, but for, because you love it, right? And if you love it, you'll have good days, you'll have bad days, but uncover those passions. And so what we talk to students a lot about is discovering within the law, what is it that's going to give them that fulfillment and, and allow them to find their passion? So the first question we pose to you all today is as you went through your education, as you went through your undergrad degree, your law degree, and, and your career, right? We have some some different folks, especially Judge Rashford, who you know started in one area and then went to the next. 
how did you uncover what you were passionate about that led you to where you are today? What was some of the most influential parts or people in your life that have led you to this point that you would encourage others to find? So we'll start um, with Julie, if you want to, to kick us off. Um, yes, I um, was, I went to law school because my mother was in law school and it just, and I had just thought, oh, you know what, this is something that I want to do. I didn't really think about it. Um, it seemed like a good, uh, good thing to do. It was just a natural, uh, but then once I got into law school, I realized that I didn't want to sit behind a desk all day, that I wanted to be a litigator. And um, you can go into a private firm and do litigation, but if you really want to be in court trying cases, your options are prosecutor, defense attorney. So my mother had been a prosecutor, and so I naturally just thought I was going to be a prosecutor too. Um, I went to their office, I tried it out, and it just didn't give me the, um, as a clerk, I tried it out and it just didn't give me the range that I, you know, I didn't have control. They had a lot more, um, they looked at you a, a little more. They, they didn't just hand things to you and let you go. Well, that's what the public defender's office did. I was in the public defender's office as a clerk for mm, probably a week and I was second chairing a jury trial. They put me on, you know, they they let me do things. I, I got to cross-examine witnesses and, you know, I, it was trial by fire um, and it was fantastic. And that is, I, I the, was bit by the bug and there was just no looking back at that point. I applied for the position. I, you know, I it, it's a lot of standing up, um, you know, just, in court, um, taking on cases, the cases, we do have a training system and they progressively train you as you go along. Um, but it's just, to me, it's the only thing that I would want to do. Um, I talk to other people about their, you know, about their, their civil jobs or, you know, their, um, uh, you know, other positions that they have. And I just can't imagine not going to court in the morning and arguing with people. So, so to me, that's what got me in, got my, you know, my interest in, um, in become, staying to be a lawyer, because if it hadn't been for that, I don't know what I would have done. Uh, it really interests me and I never looked back. And the defense attorney side of it is just so creative and you meet so many great people. Um, you're out on the street doing your own investigations. You know, I don't have police officers to do my investigations. I go into the homes. I, I question people myself. I go out all over the city and um, investigate, uh, you know, my cases. And I build a case and I present it to a jury. And, and, and as Ali knows, I, I act like it's putting on a show. You know, I'm putting on a show. When I do a jury, I put on a show. And all the work involved when I get in and finally get in the courtroom in front of that jury, um, I, I'm just, I love doing it. And um, I, and it's the type of job where you feel good about yourself, win or lose, as long as I'm, you know, doing my best and, uh, you, you know, working hard for my clients, then I go home and I feel good about myself at the end of the day. So that's why I do what I do. Wonderful, wonderful. I wish I could bring you all to watch Julie do a jury trial. You would learn so much. I learned so much. We went on trial, I think, gosh, like two weeks after I started with her and I was hooked. So um, I wish you could. And when the world opens back up, maybe we'll take a field trip and go watch. Oh, you would, you would love it. I, I, I put you to work just like I put Allie to work. I'm like, yep. don't do this. Just, you know, she was perfect. She was the perfect clerk, always just willing to do whatever I needed. It was great. It was fabulous. One of my first assignments, you guys, was finding clothes for a yes. client. Not easy when you've never worn men's pants or suits. You know, I'm like, what size? So anyways, um, if you're interested, let's let's get you in contact with Julie there after. Oh, yeah. You'll um, have a good time. You'll learn a lot. <laughs> you will. Um, Judge Rochford, if you could talk to us about, you know, your sort of path in the career, where, how you found your passion. And, and I think for students out there who are interested in a path to the bench, um, you know, that's something that 
seem so, so far away as a law student, right? Well, how could I get to that level? So when did you know that, you know, a, a seat on the benches is where you wanted to, to make your mark in this profession? So for me, it's been a stumbling journey. I did not, I was not somebody who grew up knowing, knowing this is what I wanted to do. Um, it didn't become clear to me. It revealed itself very incrementally over a long period of time. My first career was as an English high school teacher. Uh, and it was my father who encouraged me to go to law school. And I think it was because he would have been a wonderful attorney and he didn't have an opportunity to be one. So he encouraged me to do it. And I, he and I had very different personalities. Uh, he would have been a very aggressive, uh, fantastic litigator. I am, a, uh, I'm, I have a, a piece of me that is very um, more committed to a social work side of things. And through the course of my career, I really focused more on uh, not an ultimate goal, but seizing opportunities as they were presented that were good for me. And that oftentimes meant um, not because I thought it was a stepping stone to the next thing, but because there was somebody there who was going to be a great mentor and leader for me, somebody that I was going to learn from. And that just presented itself in a great variety of ways. Um, early on, I was in the state's attorney's office and I had a wonderful time. Uh, like Julie's experience, you know, um, one of my very, first we started in appeals, which was an interesting perspective to see cases from that perspective um, that were being appealed as opposed to in the courtroom. But my next step was right into the courtroom. And the day you walked in, they handed you a file and said, you know, do a trial. And that is terrifying and exhilarating, but it's the very best way to learn. And I was also always so grateful to the judges who would take the time after a trial to call me in and sometimes be critical, oftentimes be critical, but it was really such a great opportunity. You actually learn more when you lose a trial, I think, than when you win a trial. And so uh, that was all wonderful. And then I was raising my family. I had two young daughters and I wanted to have a little less um, structure than being in the state's attorney's office. So I decided to go out on my own. And I had a, I met a woman who was one of the first women in Illinois practicing law. She, she practiced for, for more than 50 years when she ultimately passed away. When she attended DePaul's Law School, she was one of three women. And she had some physical disabilities. I joined her. Uh, we both had independent practices, but she taught me the business of practicing law. And I was the legs. I did the running to court and in the process learned an enormous amount. And for me, that portion of my career where I was uh, doing a lot of estate planning. I was sitting at people's kitchen tables or their bedsides, working with families, trying to help them navigate plans uh, forward, both financially and of people's persons, setting up guardianships for children and disabled adults. And that opened a whole wonderful realm for me. And at, at the same time, I was appointed to a serve as a, you know, in the role of uh, commissioner of the court of claims, which I discussed. And I guess the, my point is, is that every opportunity I had, little pieces of myself were revealed. And it was over the course of time that I realized that some of my strengths were in helping people find resolution um, in courtroom settings, uh, both through the court of claims and also through um, working in, in local villages. But then also knowing, you know, having learned by sitting bedside and kitchen table side with people about what their needs are and um, what they're really going through when they're facing trauma, uh, when families in crisis. And so it, as those things all revealed, my path to the bench revealed itself. And um, when I got on the bench, I've gratefully, I did some criminal work, but I have spent a lot of time in the family courts and now I'm currently in probate court. And so it's all come full circle. And my original education component of my profession has really come full circle because I'm very involved in, we set up a program for judges called Paging It Forward, where we're in schools on a weekly basis, reading to kids K through four, advancing literacy. I let them put on my robe and bang the gavel. And for many kids, it's the first 
and only real opportunity they have to be kind of up close, close and personal with a judge uh, and have a more positive relationship because some kids only have a negative uh, identified judges in a very negative way. And then we also have a program where we're in high schools and it's called Your Future, Your Choice. And we're talking about decisions that you make, how critically important the decisions you make when, when you're 16 can alter or positively affect the whole rest of your life. So for me, there hasn't been a direct journey in any way. It's been little bits and pieces kind of stumbling my way through, be, being given wonderful opportunities, being mentored all along the way, um, just, you know, and, and, for, and for me, it's been a great journey, but I was not one of those lucky people who knew in third grade that this is what I wanted to do. Um, but for me, it's been, it's been wonderful. So thank you. Wonderful. And just a little tidbit for everyone. Judge is running as a candidate for Illinois Supreme Court. So we are all in the presence of, of someone who hopefully will, will secure the seat uh, due to the restructuring of districts. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. And um, we can talk about that more a bit later as well. But um, last but not least, um, you know, Mr. Gray, you talked about getting into international law and it's, it's a niche, right? And I think um, it's, it's not always a class in law school. It's surely not a class in undergrad, right? About some of these areas within the private practice of these firms. We had a session um, last season about just the variety of practice groups in these big law firms, because for folks who, who say, oh, I want to work in a firm, that is where um, I, you know, I see myself they, you know, they don't know well, what about is it lit should I go into litigation? What about transactional work? You know, what niches is sort of something I'm leaning towards. So it, throughout your career, what sort of um, helped you uncover uh, that niche within your, your practice of law? Um, that's a very interesting question, because um, when I started the practice of law back in 1985, uh, there were still lawyers who were considered themselves generalists. You know, they did everything. They just didn't do litigation or transactional work or trusts in the states. Um, but uh, but there, there were few folks, not many, who were generalists, which was how the profession started. Uh, over the years, what's happened is that um, the practice of law has gotten very specialized. So, um, I mean, there are people who do swaps only you know, in, in the transactional field or uh, people who uh, do a certain types of M&A and even M&A now, you know, there are people who are involved in private equity transactions as opposed to large strategic acquisitions. There are people who do public company, uh, you know, where two companies that are publicly traded are merging and there, there are people who do private uh, company merger transactions. So the, the practice of law has gotten quite specialized. Um, the one benefit I guess I had, I, I mentioned to you before that I was in Sao Paulo. And um, so I was in our Sao Paulo office. And obviously, I'm a US lawyer, I'm not a Brazilian lawyer, but I was helping clients um, manage the terrain in Brazil. And as a result, I was coordinating a bunch of different litigation matters. Uh, corporate matters, uh, regulatory matters. So uh, being involved in a large law firm abroad did give me that opportunity to be a little bit more of a generalist, although I am mainly an M&A lawyer. So um, in, in, the, and in fact, now what has happened is I think one needs to be very strategic in terms of what one does if one wants to go into certain areas. For example, an area that I really enjoy and I've had some, um, connection with is corruption investigations. Uh, corruption investigations are, uh, you know, quite involved, uh, expensive and involve uh, doing internal investigations with employees and uh, other, uh, you know, stakeholders of a company. Uh, but then once you find the results, you end up having often to engage with the uh, public authorities, both abroad and in the United States, the Department of Justice, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and it, if one is interested in that, right now anyway, the, the, the path for getting into that is to be a public prosecutor, a, a U.S. attorney, because they are the ones who know the uh, 
the SEC or the DOJ and how they negotiate. So, um, you know, if you want to go into that area, you may want to consider sort of strategically working either with uh, a U.S. Attorney's Office, the Department of Justice, or SEC, and then going into private practice. I I'm not sure that's necessarily the best um, the best way for lawyers to get the skills they need, but that's the accepted way. Uh, I say that because, for example, when you're doing an investigation in Brazil, uh, a lot of these uh, people who are doing investigations are, are former U.S. attorneys, uh, but they don't have the language or the cultural skills. So they're, uh, in effect, asking questions of Brazilian employees without really uh, understanding uh, what their uh, background is, their way of thinking. Uh, and oftentimes they're, at, they're usually asking the questions in English and then having a translator translate the questions into Portuguese. And uh, I don't think that's very efficient to, uh, to get the results that are needed. But right now, at least the view is if you want to be involved in that area, you have to uh, have the work with the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office or uh, with uh, you know, the DOJ, the Department of Justice. Uh, it, it's a great field, obviously, you get a, a lot of exposure to things all over the world and an insight into how business works, how people's minds work. Um, so I, I find that quite interesting, but I obviously can't remake my career to be uh, a U.S. attorney. Uh, I have been involved tangentially or you know, to a fair extent uh, with some uh, fairly high profile uh, corruption investigations in particular in Brazil. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's not something I can just focus my career on because I don't have the background. Similarly, uh, antitrust now has become a huge field internationally. In the beginning, it was only the US and, uh, you know, that had antitrust laws. While I was practicing, uh, you had the EU and the European Union uh, establish their antitrust laws. And then now almost every country in the world has, has an antitrust uh, regime. Uh, I'm working on a transaction right now where uh, it's between a US company and a Japanese company. Uh, they're dissolving a joint venture. And it turns out the only countries we have to actually get approval in are in Col Brazil, Colombia, and Paraguay. Um, there's no antitrust approval required in the United States or in uh, Japan or in other jurisdictions. Um, and so again, that, 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 that is an interesting area. Again, most of the antitrust lawyers I know of um, spent time with the uh, antitrust uh, authorities, either at the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and so if that's an area you want to work in ultimately find interesting, you need an economics background, but you also need to have worked uh, probably with one of those two agencies. Um, even though, again, I'm not sure it's necessarily all the attributes you need, obviously, in dealing with an antitrust authority in, uh, in, in Latin America or in Asia, you'd probably would be helpful to have the language and, again, understand how the country and the economics are set up in those countries. Uh, but again, uh, I think there's a need to be strategic. So um, my, my uh, recommendation to folks is uh, law is much more specialized, at least in the, I think even all of us are, who are on the panel are, are sort of somewhat specialized, um, but it's becoming increasingly more specialized and you need to figure out what do you want to do or what are the opportunities um, by talking to people and doing research on the internet uh, and then figuring out because the, the, there are endless opportunities now and endless information out there. And, and um, it, it's an exciting time, but it's a, a challenging time as well to try to figure out what you want to do. Hopefully that uh, Ellie answers the question. Yeah, that, that, that definitely answered the question. Um, and, and thank you for being very, very insightful. Uh, so as we've heard, a very integral part of how you decide your legal career is, you know, trying out the different experiences, even some experiences that, you know, you might not necessarily perceive yourself in. And as a Juliet alluded to earlier, um, figuring out what you don't like tends to be just as important as knowing what you do like. So to that end, what internships did you have or classes that you took during law school or early on in your career um, that 
kind of sort of give you gave you a little bit of insight on how you wanted your career to look like and how did you get the most out of those internships uh mr kapoor we'll start with you um so i i basically um spent my last year of college in uh, bogota colombia and i really enjoyed that experience and so uh it, it convinced me that i did want to be involved in latin america i really enjoy the culture the people the language and so it's not an internship but it was an experience living abroad which uh, you know i think had a big impact on me uh in terms of internships uh, i basically worked at a couple of law firms in the summer i worked uh, with a law firm in rochester new york uh, which is now nixon peabody is the name but it was back then it was nixon hargrave devins and doyle uh i spent a summer there and then i spent a uh, my second summer actually at a, a law firm uh, I split my summer. I spent a law, uh, my time at a law firm in uh, San Francisco called Heller Ehrman, and the other half with uh, the law firm Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. Um, so it, it gave me an exposure to the private law firms each of those summers um, and uh, the different cities as well and different practice areas. So um, that, it, I guess, probably inspired me to some extent. Um, I did clerk for a judge. Uh, I enjoyed it, but um, I, I enjoy more sort of the give and take of negotiation and dealing with people as opposed to being in court. Uh, and so I think that as someone, one of the panelists mentioned, it also gives you an idea of what you don't want to do. Um, so I, I guess that that maybe is just as important. I, uh, you know, for example, I knew that I didn't want to live in San Francisco or in New York. Um, I, I didn't want to be a litigator. So I would urge folks to do different things. And I think now my sense is the law schools and the community organizations give you opportunities to do all sorts of exciting and interesting internships during the summer, both in the US and abroad. And I would urge many of you to take that opportunity, um, which I, was really not that uh, prevalent when I was in law school back in the early 80s. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then Julie, we'll start with you. Yes, as I mentioned before, I uh, was, I, I clerked for the state's attorney's office um, and I just wasn't given the opportunities there. I could see the, the public defender's clerk sitting on the other side of the room and the public defender's clerk was up and handling cases and arguing things. And I asked, why am I not doing that? And when the answer wasn't satisfactory, I just went to the you know, my, my um, law school evidence teacher and said, I wanna go to the PD's office. And I did, I went to the PD's office and um, I, I was hooked. Now, I, while I was in law school, I did try other things. I clerked for um, a, a private um, uh, firm and it was a lot of contracts and reviewing contracts. And I just, you know, I was, I, I wanted to make sure I was making the right decision because when you become a public defender, you always think it's going to be something temporary. And it, it can be for some people, but other people, you bite, you get bitten by that bug and it's like working in the circus and you're never going to be able to go back to sitting behind a desk. And so there are, you have to be very careful when you come to this office because you might not be satisfied any longer, you know, with the quiet, reliable law firm job because when you come to like um, 26 in California or any of the courtrooms um, courthouses in in um, Cook County uh, or whatever uh, I would imagine in any real county where you could clerk to be uh, be a public defender or a um, prosecutor it's just a lot of action and um and some people love it. I absolutely love it. I love thinking on my feet. I love um, making arguments out of nowhere, you know, coming up with, um, uh, you know, cases that just, uh, you know, and, and trying to win my cases, coming up with um, legal cases. And um, if, and I saw that through my clerkship. And so then I applied for our office and I've been there ever since. And I uh, mentor a lot of clerks that come through and you can see the spark in their eyes and you can see the ones that are going to apply for our office and going to, you know, come, come there because they just get hooked. You, you literally get hooked to the adrenaline of the building. And, um, 
I would, if you, if any of that sounds interesting, come and give us a summer <laughs> and, and you'll see if you can handle it. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, interesting place uh, to work. You are, you are the headlines. You know, I handle cases that are in the news every day. And if that interests you at all, then, you know, you, you come and clerk for us and you can be a part of it and see if you would like to stay. That's, that, that's amazing to hear. And it's also uh, very important to just know, even if you do have a little bit of apprehension about certain jobs, you know, just go, just go try it out. Mm -hmm. um, either you get the spark, like Julian, you stay, or, you know, you find something else that's more in tune with your personality and your skill set. So that's, that's wonderful insight. Thank you so much. Uh, and then Judge Rashford. So in law school, I, I went to Loyola and there was a great focus on social justice and our responsibility to commit to social justice. And it just really opened my mind and it resonated um, very deeply with me. And so I really found a lot of wonderful opportunities and experiences through volunteering, through bar association. Um, and, and, and what I also learned is, you know, there are a million opportunities to volunteer they don't all fit each of us. You've got to find one that really connects with you and that you feel um, you know, a real excitement about. Early on for me, there was a, a volunteer opportunity in the Cook County Courts, helping people navigate guardianships. And I volunteered for a long time and I, I, was, I was observing people with, um, who were in crisis and, needed to navigate a very complex legal system for something that they had to get done. Um, and it was so overwhelming to them. And so they had this wonderful program in Cook County and I, I volunteered with it for a long time. And then when I started practicing more in Lake County, I went to the probate court judge and I said, you know, maybe we should sit, set something up like that here. And she said, okay, go ahead and do it. That's the only danger. If you bring that idea to someone, they probably will want you to, to go ahead and do it. But we, we did, it's still in existence today. In fact, I just came from the probate courtroom and uh, we still have volunteers assisting people through that process. But the lessons I learned were a couple of things. When you see something that needs to be done or there's a way to assist people, you know, do it, get involved, Sug make a suggestion. Of course, you know, you don't do it yourself. You, you go to somebody in, in authority and you ask them if, that, if they see that need also. And then usually it's collaborative. You put a team together of people and to see it realized is really just so wonderful. And to see it have an enduring impact is so great. And the other thing is, and it, other of the, the speakers have, have referenced it, don't be afraid to reach out to people in authority if it's somebody that you particularly admire or if it's work that you're interested in doing. Sometimes we think, oh gosh, you know, I can't call that person or send that person a letter. Um, you would be surprised how really flattered people are to hear from you and how eager they are to help you. So, and you've got nothing to lose. If they don't return the call or they don't respond to your note, you've lost nothing, but I would say 99% of the time, even people in high authority or what you perceive to be high authority are more than happy to help you in any way that they can, um, because that's what our profession does. Uh, that is so typical of attorneys to be so generous with their time and their resources and their information. And um, so, so reach out and don't hesitate. Wonderful. And for all of our attendees listening, like we always say here at the Impact Project, your network is your net worth. We harp on that so much here. So, um, you know, like Judge just mentioned, reach out to people, right? If there's something you're interested in, that's how you're going to uncover your passions. Um, so we're in the last like 13 minutes here. Um, and I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. So, so we have 
us hosts here have, have two last questions for you all and then we'll open it up for q a so attendees get your questions ready so we can get them answered here at the end i know we've touched on it briefly and some different answers that have come through um, and i know for all of you there's no way you could sit here and tell us what your day is like every single day because every day is different in the practice of law but if you had to summarize um, just briefly what a day in the life is like uh, on the bench in the PD's office at Jones Day or, or a similar situated firm, what is your day like? Um, just so our students can can gain a little bit of insight into um, you know what they'd be entering if they if they followed your path. So, Judge, why don't we just kick it off with you? What your day is like on the bench? Well, the day of a judge is more structured, I think, than some other um, professions, or certainly more than when I was in private practice, where I had a lot more flexibility in terms of um, directing my day. But in, in my day in court, I, I am in court every morning. Um, we open the court call at 9 a.m., but I'm always here at 8.30 or earlier. Um, and the I have a court call every single morning from 9 until 12.00. And then we have a lunch break. And in the afternoons, I will hear special set matters and trials. And, and that is a, a standard day. And then in the afternoons, if I'm not hearing trials, I'm preparing either written rulings or preparing for the next day. I, I touch every file in advance of a court call um, to be prepared. I read every courtesy copy. Um, if someone's going to take the time to present me with documents uh, about a court case in advance, you can be guaranteed that I'm going to have read them and be prepared so that we're not wasting anyone's time. But it's a very structured day. And, um, and then, you know, certainly when you're on trial, uh, you're sometimes it goes well into the evening with your prep time. And, but the, the standard day in the courtroom is typically between nine and five. And that's also in consideration of other staff people like the clerks and the court officers and um, other security people. So uh, that's the traditional day. Wonderful. Julie, I don't think I could ever describe a day in life of PD. I don't think I, when I was with you, I was with Julie for a full year, you guys, and I don't think I ever had the same day twice. So how would you describe a day in the life of a PD, especially in homicide? Just hold on, just hold on by the seat. You know, you're just holding on, hoping that your day doesn't explode halfway through. Um, every day is different. It's um, you. You do like uh, Judge Rochford said. You do have some control over your schedule. If you're, you know, you're in a courtroom, you handle the court call, you show up at a certain time. Some days you'll have motions or trials in the afternoons, and if you don't, then you go out and you do your investigations or your work on your your case but you never know <laughs> the thing is about being a public defender you never know when something's going to explode and when like you don't know if the jury's going to go you work it up and sometimes they go sometimes they don't and when you're on jury trial the world has to revolve around you everything else falls by the wayside you're out of the house but at the crack of dawn you're coming home late at night but you know and there's it, it takes a lot out of you, but it's very fulfilling in the end. Um, so every day is different, um, but at the same time, there is a routine to it that you can develop. And it all kind of, you know, it all depends on what judge you're in front of. If you have a judge like Judge Rashford that works between nine and five, then you you know your schedule and you know how to work around that schedule. But if you have a judge that, you know, comes and goes and, you know, you, you just never know what you're gonna get. Um, However, it, it, in our office, it changes. You'll do a couple of uh, a year, you'll do a year in front of Judge Rochford, then you'll do a year in front of a different judge. And then there's positions in our office where you're not assigned to any judge at all. It's all vertical. You, you're, in, you have, you're in control of your own schedule. So it, it, it kind of, you just have to come to the office and figure out what's right for you and what you're comfortable with. And, um, and there's so many different options. Uh, you know, there's juvenile, there's a, a, a juvenile where you only represent kids, there's um, uh, misdemeanors, there's domestic violence, there's homicide task force, there's felony, there's prelims. There's so many different opportunities for you to find out what exactly you want to do. And once you find something, 
you know, traffic. Some people stay in traffic their entire careers doing um, DUI cases and they love it. So, uh, you know, you'll find something in our office and, um, and then you can control your schedule around it. Wonderful, wonderful. And last but not least, Mr. Kapoor, when it comes to your day to day, I think, you know, I'm sure it was a, a tad different being an associate to now being a partner. So if you could just touch on um, your day to day in the life of a partner at Jones Day, what does that look like um, for folks who, who aspire to, to reach that level? Well, I, I think that uh, you pointed out one very important um, issue is, or a, a factor is that as your career progresses, your day changes. Um, and, but even more importantly than that, what's happened over years is as technology has changed and with the pandemic, um, your life experiences, your day experiences change. Um, obviously, you know, during the pandemic, uh, when it first started, I was in Brazil. And in Brazil, um, the culture is such that people want to meet. So if you have an issue to discuss here in the United States, you just pick up the phone, you have a conference call and people uh, resolve the issue, even complicated issues. In Brazil, simpler issues even, they want to have that face-to-face -face contact. And so you would get together and meet with in person when a, a phone call would suffice, but that's just the way it culturally was done. Um, it was just, you know, part of it is just the local culture and being attuned to it and how to get, get it done. Uh, when I started the practice of law, we didn't really have technology. I mean, you did everything by hand. I remember, you know, now we have redlining uh, programs where you can show changes in documents. Back then as a young associate, I had to redline by hand. Um, there weren't faxes even. And so you would be rushing to get a document to the overnight, to the overnight express, you know, Federal Express or whatever it was back then, and you knew the different hours for the different services, so you could get the document. Now, if you need to send something, you simply, um, you know, with the press of a button, you email it, and it's done. So, um, technology has really changed the life of lawyers and private law firms, at least in the corporate side. I think in, in all all respects, and um, it used to be at Jones Day here in Cleveland. Uh, we served breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and on Saturdays, the, the cafeteria was open. Nowadays, no one is, you know, especially with the pandemic, no one's there. Um, you can do everything remotely. You don't need to be in the office. Um, so that's changed a lot as well. Um, but <clears throat> I guess in terms of my day, uh, a lot of it is getting on phone calls, um, emails, discussing things with clients, uh, marking up documents. Uh, connecting with uh, counsel abroad. I've, I'm working on a project right now where we're uh, helping a company put in place uh, a uh, rewards program for its distributors all over Latin America. Uh, and we need to be very careful because in Latin America, each country, many of the countries have uh, specific laws that protect distributors. And so you wanna put in place programs that don't increase your liability. And that means that obviously connecting or talking with the local lawyers in each of those countries. So, um, you know, we'll be getting on calls. In fact, now the other interesting thing in Brazil is here everybody uses cell phones, but there everybody uses WhatsApp. And so you're always talking, to us, not sending emails, but sending WhatsApp texts and calling people on WhatsApp. So I think, uh, I guess my, my takeaway here is your duties uh, as a lawyer do change from when you're an associate to when you're a partner and during the various stages of your career. Um, as, as a young associate, you're doing more in the corporate side, at least you're doing more due diligence. Um, you're doing first draft of documents. Um, you're being playing more of a supportive role. Um, and th But that in itself has changed. It used to be to do due diligence, you had to go to a, fly somewhere where the company had a boxes of documents that you went through and uh, looked at looked at them carefully. Now everything's electronic. Everything's on, um, you know, LinkedIn, not LinkedIn, but on um, different uh, platforms and you can just access documents um, remotely. So, so part of what you needed to travel for is no longer necessary. And now I think with the pandemic, that's gonna even be more the case that everything's going to be done virtually. Uh, people aren't going to be traveling, which I think is a shame because the face-to-face -face contact is important. 
Um, but um, I think that's going to change. But over the time periods, you know, obviously, as you get more senior in a law firm, what were more sort of day-to-day uh, -day sort of tasks change. You're more of a supervisory role. Um, you're, you're using the judgment and the experience you've gotten over the years of practice uh, to, to make decisions and to uh, guide others. Um, and I, I'd like to go back uh, to what Judge Rockford said is reach out to folks, even within a law firm. Um, I think they're too, you, you know, you'd be surprised if you just walk into a partner's uh, office or reach out to them by phone, they'll be quite responsive. And, and it, oftentimes one thinks, you know, that if you're a woman, you want to talk to a woman partner, or if you're a uh, minority lawyer, you want to talk to a minority partner. That's not always the case. In fact, you'll be surprised how open people are. Uh, and you need to get in, over, at least I needed to get in over my inhibition. The other thing that's very important in a law firm is to talk to your contemporaries or the people who are a couple of years older than you are because they know how to get things done. And that oftentimes a lot of young associates, associates spend a lot of time spinning their wheel, trying to draft something up or create something when it already exists. And all you gotta do is reach out to someone, a phone call, and you can save yourself a lot of time and uh, you know, have your work done in a way that uh, is much more polished if, if you, get the input of your uh, colleagues. And, and a lot of those colleagues are people who are maybe a year or two years older than you. So uh, do make the opportunity to network within a law firm or any organization you're in. Thank you so much. So obviously we've gotten so much amazing advice already from all the panelists. Uh, Sanjeev at the beginning mentioned the value of having a community. Uh, Julie alluded to trying out different experiences to, you know, find the one that fits with that fits you most. Um, just Rashford discussed how important it is to reach out to people uh, who are in a field you're interested in, because those individuals are a source of, you know, knowledge and mentorship. So I know we're short on time, but just really briefly, uh, what's not the number one piece of advice that you would have for students who are unsure what career path they wish to take? And uh, Mr. Kapoor, we'll just start with you. Um, I, I think what you need to do is um, try things out. I mean, um, you really won't know what you like or don't like um, unless you actually go and, you know, do an internship or a, a, a so, you know, try something out. And, and it may turn out that what you learn that you don't like something is just as important as you do like it. So that, that would be one uh, point. Second, talk to people, network. I mean, people, there are, especially today with technology and the internet, you, you can basically figure out what's going on and, and, and do your research and do your homework. Um, so those are a couple of things I would mention. Thank you. And then we'll go to Judge Rashford. Be open-minded and be enthusiastic. I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson that said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. So just keep an open mind. Every opportunity has got some benefit seize it and, um, you know, and enjoy it. Wonderful. And last but certainly not least, Julie. Talk to your other law students and uh, find out what they're doing. And, uh, you know, that's how I found about, about a lot of internships, a lot of uh, opportunities, a lot of places to volunteer. I just talked to my other friends in law school or just people I was in class with, and they had a lot of really great suggestions. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, we have two questions that have come into the chat. Um, just super briefly um, for Mr. Kapoor, there was one that came in um, from an individual who's a foreign trained attorney from India who wants to know how she should um, use her degree in the maximum possible way. Okay, um, I, I take it from that and I'd be glad to talk to the person if they want to reach out to me uh, or anybody else wants to reach out to me. Um, uh, my email address is skapoor at jonesday.com and uh, if you go online at jonesday.com you can actually get my phone number as well. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me. But um, it's a tough quandary for people who have a law degree from abroad uh, because unfortunately those law degrees are not as valued here in the U.S. as a U.S. law degree. Um, and so uh, I think um, a lot of, um, if you're a young lawyer, someone who's just, you know, who's 
who's recently graduated from law school, what I would recommend is to actually get, I know it's three years, but I, I would uh, get a JD. Um, there are LLM programs, but I find that people who have LLMs are not as marketable in the US as those who have a local JD degree. So that, that would be my, um, you know, if, if you're young enough and you're willing to do that, uh, that would be my advice to anybody who has a degree abroad, um, because unfortunately, uh, there, I mean, there are people who've done, done well with foreign law degrees without US law degrees, but uh, ultimately, if you're going to practice in the United States, you need to uh, be a US lawyer uh, or a lawyer from one of the states. And, and, and just the fact that you don't have a US law degree, is at, le at least initially, will hurt you. If you can get a job with a law firm or with you know, doing something, that often open up, opens up avenues, but it's a longer road and you may not necessarily get the same level of job that you want. Um, but if, if that's not an option to, go, to get a US law degree or, or even to go for an LLM, um, I would just network. I would uh, talk to people. I would, volunteer, I would actually volunteer as an intern uh, and show your worth and that you, you do have the uh, intelligence and the drive and the dedication. Uh, and, and then you'll meet people who will uh, be your sort of mentors and your supporters, and, and that, that would be a way to do it. But um, unfortunately, uh, it, it's a tough road unless you have a U.S. law degree. Wonderful. Okay. I know we're four minutes over. I really hate to keep you all um, any longer. I know you all have very busy schedules. I see we have a hand raised. Um, so I, what we're going to do just for sake of time um, for our panelists, if you're willing, I know Mr. Kapoor, you said what we'd normally do is um, send out your contact information. Should you be willing to our mailing list um, after this session? Um, so folks who have questions that weren't able to, to get them answered um, can reach out. So um, if that's acceptable for you all as panelists, please just send me an email and let me know. I see some head nods. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we really um, appreciate your time. So for everyone who has joined us today, I hope this was very helpful. Again, like I say at the end of every session, your network is your net worth. So make sure to reach out to these individuals who are willing to spend time answering your questions. That's how you're going to find your passion. That's how you're going to find the job that you love. Um, so Mr. Kapoor, Judge, Julie, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for taking time out of your morning um, to be with us today. Um, we will share your contact information with our uh, members. So hopefully um, some further conversations can be had. Thank you to my wonderful co-host for joining. Um, really, really appreciate you taking time. You guys, he is also someone great to know. If you missed the beginning of the session, he's at the NFL right now. He's going into big law in New York City here after student of the year tons of info there too. So please reach out to him. Um, I know he's willing to talk to you guys as well. So thank you. Thank you. Big round of applause. Um, and my interns who are on this call, Nura Tolu, are, are going to let me know who won our scholarship. So stay tuned for your email. Um, let's just see if you're the lucky winner. So thank you all so much. I'll stop the recording. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Alex.